All right, welcome everybody to today's um, lecture and uh, guest series um, by Noah Snavely. It's a real pleasure to have Noah here today. Noah is a professor at Cornell Tech and also a Google researcher in New York City. Um, I would say everybody in the field of 3D vision probably knows who Noah is. He has done really fundamental work. I would say like his, his work on 3D reconstruction, structure from motion has been inspiration to many of us, but not only the academic papers, also the, the great bundler code that everybody probably knows um, is very, very famous in the community. Building Rome in a day is a seminal um, research that you know has inspired many other research on top of it. And Noah very recently also does a lot of stuff on novel viewpoint synthesis, which is you know very popular because we want to capture reality. And we are very, very happy to hear him today talk about reconstructing the phenotypic function. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. This is so cool. It's, it, it's so great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, uh, and I don't know if you can hear in the background, but there are some kids, including like crying, maybe crying babies, and you'll, you may see a cameo from like a four-year-old. Uh, so we'll keep on rolling, but just wanted to give you a heads up. <laughs> uh, sorry if you hear some background noise. Uh, yeah, so this is great. I'm going to be talking about reconstructing the panoptic function. Uh, okay, what's the panoptic function? Well, we'll get to it. But first, as motivation, you know, a big goal of computer graphics and other areas like art and photography is to capture and depict the world in ever more immersive and compelling ways, right? So um, people have sought to do this throughout history with whatever media was available, like you know, whether it's painting and the perspective correct painting in the 18th, uh, 18th century and earlier, uh, you know, photography starting in the 19th century, or you know, once you have photography, you can do stereo photography and view your stereo pair of the Pantheon and uh, in, a, in a stereoscope. And, uh, you know, the idea being you can feel like you're really standing in front of the Pantheon. And I could go on and on. There's like VR technologies and so on. But some of my favorite kinds of um, projects and technologies are those that strive not to capture just the famous landmarks of the world, like your Pantheons, but try and capture and reproduce the entire world. So uh, an example I really like of this, an early example that I think is underappreciated, is uh, called the Aspen Movie Map. So this was a project from the late 70s and early 80s um, from the MIT Media Lab uh, to capture the city of Aspen and then reproduce it in an interactive interface. So this is like street view, but 30 years ahead of its time. Uh, and so what they did is they got a car, they put a camera on top of it, they drove through Aspen, Colorado, uh, filming it. They saved that to an optical video disc. Okay, I'm gonna move while I talk because there's a baby in the background. I'll move somewhere quieter. Uh, and then, uh, they built an interactive interface where you can sit and um, you know experience this interactively. You can you know from the comfort of your own living room drive through Aspen with buttons and so on. And you know this is essentially Street View. And here's a little video, you know, charming early '80s era uh, video of, of this interface in action. And so this is great. This I, I don't know. I find this really amazing. Um, and but if you really want to capture what Aspen is like, you know, it's not enough to capture just locations because places change over time. So Colorado looks very different in the summer versus the winter. Um, and so they, you know, they capture different seasons. You can view them in, in this interface. Um, and so this is all written up in this very beautiful, I guess, typewritten <laughs> uh, SIGGRAPH 1980 paper. Um, this is just, I think, chock full of very um, pioneering ideas and how to capture the entire world. Um, and you know, I also there's so many interesting things about this. I like the fact that they include the word, like the medium optical video disc in the title of the paper uh, is interesting to me. I think it's because this you know, like um, ability to store lots of images and and more or less randomly access them was uh, very instrumental. So um, you know, definitely worth a read. Uh, so, but this gets to a larger idea. This the sort of idea of capturing everything uh, hints at this concept of the panoptic function, which was a uh, this uh, introduced in this pioneering paper by uh, Ted Ellison and Bergen in 1991, uh, where uh, they this idea of the panoptic function is a hypothetical function that represents everything you could possibly ever see. Okay, so every possible ray traveling through space at any time is represented in this in this panoptic function. So panoptic function is a function, you know, in some forms it's a seven parameter function of uh, basically okay a ray position x y z a ray direction theta phi, uh, wavelength lambda, and time t. So basically, it, that captures what a camera would see along that ray according to those parameters. Um, 
And so what does this contain? Well, this, if you could capture this function, you could represent every possible view from every moment, from every, you know, at every time. So, um, you know, by, as a corollary, it contains every possible photograph, every video, anything that anyone has ever seen or could ever see. Um, so yeah, it's this amazing function that you can uh, imagine. But, uh, and if you could capture it, it would be, you know, a seminal moment in computer graphics, because that would mean you could teleport anywhere at any time. It's sort of the uh, street view or Aspen movie map, but, uh, you know, the, the sort of culmination of what that would mean. Uh, but of course, it's completely hopeless to capture. Uh, it's just, you know, th there's, there's no way you could ever hope to even capture a, a, even a tiny portion of this function, but you could try. And so um, if you wanted to capture this, you have some interesting tools now available, uh, like um, this idea of capturing light fields, which is a kind of slice of the panoptic function has been popular recently for uh, VR applications. So um, a few years ago, Google introduced a jump camera, which is 16 cameras arranged in a ring, which allows you to capture stereoscopic 360 video uh, and then view that in VR. And then more recently, this year, we saw um, you know, an even more grandiose camera from Google. Um, it's, it's a bunch of cameras arranged on a hemisphere from which you can capture a uh, full six stop light field video. Um, and there's a bunch of ways, uh, technology they interest to make this possible, but it looks something like this. I know you probably can't, the, the video is probably not co coming across that well, but um, this is uh, allowing both free viewpoint in space as the video progresses in time. And so these technologies are, are amazing. And so maybe you could bring these to bear in capturing the world. You, you know, one idea would be to just <laughs> populate the entire world, diffuse cameras throughout all of time, uh, all of space, and just capture video all the time. So imagine like a webcam everywhere. Well, that would be a you know hopeless dystopia. But um, uh, it's also completely impractical. Impractical. You just can't fit cameras everywhere in space. So instead of you know sort of the brute force sampling approach, uh, we have to sample more smartly and reconstruct this function if we want to capture it. Uh, so that is essentially what Street View does. Uh, so Street View, the kind of modern version of S Movie Map, drives, you know, puts cameras on cars and drives them through the world. And of course, Street View has captured lots and lots of places, probably you know, millions of miles driven by this point. Um, so it's, it's, I don't know, maybe the most, <laughs> the, the thing in the world that has the most claim to capturing the panoptic function uh, because of its massive geographic coverage, you know, uh, most continents, et cetera. But it's still a sparse sampling in space and time. So, you know, if you imagine how Street View captures the world, they capture maybe a panorama every five meters um, every time the car drives, and then maybe they'd come over, you know, they drive over the same spot, uh, you know, six months or years later, uh, or you know, maybe on the other side of the road, so they don't capture exactly the same places. So, it's this kind of sparse, weird sampling of the panoptic function. Okay, so uh, that's one idea: putting cameras on cars and driving them all around. Another idea that I've been very intrigued by throughout my career is, you know, reconstructing the world uh, or the panoptic function from all photos on the internet. So, um, you know, doing a search for a landmark like the Trevi Fountain, building 3D model, you know, building, uh, building up, uh, treating this as a sampling of the panoptic function, trying to reconstruct the full panoptic function from such images. Um, and you know, so we have good tools for this as well, or, or you know, at least some tools are in place like. 3D reconstruction, um, as Matthias mentioned earlier. Okay, um, but if you think about how these images sample the panoptic function, okay, they're quite dense. Like, okay, in this uh, point cloud reconstructed using structural motion, all these cameras, all these black pyramids represent camera positions. So you can see they kind of form dense clusters. But if you think about spatio-temporal sampling, uh, it's still rather sparse, right? Like if you imagine, how, you know, think of all the photos captured on a particular day, you know, maybe one or two got uploaded to Flickr uh, and, you know, that's not enough to really sample densely space and time. Okay, so in both these cases, both the kind of street view collection paradigm and internet photos, we have a sparse sampling of images, X, Y, Z, T of this panoptic function. And so what we do want to do is reconstruct the full panoptic function from these samples, okay? And so, you know, uh, another way to put this, you want to interpolate or extrapolate any new image at any new place and time. And the exciting thing is we have, you know, especially over the past even two years, we've started to have very good tools, both data and algorithms for this reconstruction problem. And I'll talk about that today. Uh, 
uh, at both talk about planoptic reconstruction uh, at both landmark and city scales. I'll talk about two different projects uh, attacking both of those um, aspects. Now, uh, you know, if you really are talking about the true planoptic function, it would contain like all sorts of things like people and cars and things moving through time. Um, right now, we're not trying to capture those kind of phenomena. We're not trying to do like true, you know, we're not trying to do surveillance or anything like that. We're trying to capture the underlying scene. So you can think of them as like more or less, we're trying to render a long exposure photograph where all of the moving objects are blurred away and what's left is the stuff that, you know, is sort of static. Okay. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the dynamic objects again at the end. Uh, okay, but so that's the setting. So uh, first I want to talk about a paper that appeared at ECV this year um, from Cornell Tech. Uh, uh, um, the first author is Jung Chi Lee, who's, who's done a lot of great work in this area, um, called Crowd Sampling the Planoptic Function. Uh, so reconstructing landmark scale uh, slices of the planoptic function. And to start, I want to just show a clip from the video that we made. You know, as most of you know, this was a very video driven ECV. And we had a very good video made by Abe, who's a very, uh, Abe Davis, he's now a Cornell uh, University faculty member, um, but also a video guru. So I'll just, I think I, I selected sound sharing. So you should be Crowd able to sampling hear. the planoptic function by Zenchi Li, Wen Chi Xian, Abe Davis, and Noah Snavely. Most of us carry a camera almost everywhere we go. Nowhere is this more apparent than in a popular tourist attraction, where you'll often find as many cameras as there are people. And this leads to a lot of photos, which we can think of collectively as the result of a kind of crowd sampling over time. Now, a lot of those photos eventually get posted online, where they become freely accessible to anyone with an internet connection. So in this work, we explore how to use that crowd sample data to turn regular photos into something that lets us move around a scene, both in space and across changes to appearance that happen over time. Okay. So that kind of sets the stage. And by the way, in addition to this project being pretty cool, I think the video is sets a high bar just because, uh, you know, I think we could all learn lessons from Abe. He's a real After Effects head. Uh, but anyway, OK, so that sort of sets the stage for what we want to do. So um, we can think of this panoptic function. You know, a simple version would be, let's, let's just think about it in 2D, where we have, instead of three dimensions for viewpoint, or however many, you know, we have one, you know, the y-axis is viewpoint. Uh, the hi, this is Charlotte. Okay, Charlotte, that, you need to go finish your lunch. Okay, you can sit here for a second, but I'm talking to my friends. Okay. Let's go. Okay, Charlotte, you uh, go ask mommy for a jacket, okay? Okay, we have a kid cameo here. Okay, Charlotte, I can hold you, but you have to be quiet. Okay, so a planop the planoptic function, imagine each point on this 2D plot being an image. So we have viewpoint as the y axis. You know, time as the uh, as the x-axis, uh, the planoptic function. You know, each point in this represents an image from that viewpoint in time. So what we want to do is capture this entire function, and what you, you can imagine slices of this. So uh, points with the same time but different viewpoints. Um, basically, that represents a if you have a if you have a sample of those uh, you know such a sampling, uh, reconstructing that column is a you know basically view view interpolation problem. So uh, you know, rep re rendering of a light field from a sample of views at the same time. If you have uh, samples from the same viewpoint but different times, uh, that's basically a time lapse video. So if you have a sparse sampling, that is sort of a time lapse reconstruction problem, which maybe could be done, you know, with style transfer methods. Um, but what we have in this crowd sampling pro project is a sparse, a, a very different sparse sampling of this uh, of this planoptic function. And uh, by the way. A lot of these timestamps are not very accurate. You know, most of them are completely hopeless, worthless. So we also don't know exactly where each point is localized in time in, in our set of samples of, say, the Trevi Fountain that we download from the internet. OK, so uh, to solve this problem, we, uh, we introduce a new scene representation, uh, neural scene representation called a deep multiplane image. So to address these the challenges, ADM. we introduce a new neural scene representation called deep multiplane images, or deep MPIs which offer a way to represent viewpoint slices of the planoptic function that interpolate meaningfully between changes of appearance that happen over time. Good. So yeah, you can see on the right side, the output, which is the, it gives you the ability to move around in space and also change time you know, at the same, you know, simultaneously. And so the idea is this will 
absorb all those um, you know, random images. OK, here's this, another set of the Piazza Navona in Rome. Um, absorb those random images from random times and learn to you know, basically digest them into a format where, despite not knowing what time each one was taken, you can still learn the space of appearance and interpolate it meaningfully in this deep MPI. OK, uh, giving you, again, the ability to move around in space and time. By the way, thank you for bearing with me with the kids coming by. Uh, th that might not be the last time. OK, so uh, how do we do this? Well, uh, we start again with uh, taking your photos, crowdsourced photos, and running, th uh, running them through reconstruction. Um, while Bundler is great, the, the best tool for this now uh, open source tool that I know of is Colmap by Johannes Schoenberger. Uh, and so um, then we, uh, once we have this 3D reconstruction, we fit a deep MPI to them. So I thought I'd just, you know, for those of, of you who aren't familiar with MPIs, uh, this was an idea that was first introduced by Rick Selisky actually, uh, you know, 20 years ago, um, but has recently been the basis of a lot of different light field rendering work in, in computer graphics and vision. So the idea is you slice space into a bunch of planes with RGBA values. So, you know, uh, planes with color and opacity, which allow you to, uh, you know, if you render, if you view them from this reference position, you can see compelling scene synthesis results, which capture even things like specularities. Uh, and again, uh, I actually didn't realize this until Rick pointed out very politely, but this idea that we've been exploring um, was introduced in computer vision in the, in the stereo uh, um, literature. So basically, uh, they came up with this, the same representation to represent uh, space with colors and opacities it, uh, discretized into these slices. Um, and you know, actually, this paper won the was a Mar Prize runner up, but I think a lot of people, including myself, didn't know about it. So, it shows that you know a lot of classic work is very relevant today. Um, so these kinds of layered representations have been explored a lot in computer graphics and vision, and uh, you know MPI is a, a specific kind of layered representation. And actually, it was you know it also even before Rick and uh, Galina uh, looked at it, this idea had been used, similar ideas have been used in the um, 2D animation community. So, uh, you know, I'm a history lover. So I just mentioned this, <laughs> you basically Disney Corporation invented this multiplane camera idea in the 1930s as a way of kind of rendering 3D effects with 2D animation. The idea is you have a camera like here looking at a set of stacked transparencies. You know, each transparency has stuff painted on at a specific kind of layer in space. And if you move the if you move these layers at different speeds, as you take pictures of them through them, you will get uh, 3D effects like uh, that look like this um, from these 2D layers. So it's basically, you know, sort of a parallax scrolling, uh, similar to parallax scrolling in video games kind of idea. Uh, so multiplane images use this same concept, but computationally, where you have a reference viewpoint and imagine a set of stacked transparencies, RGBA image layers at different distances uh, uh, sampled according to this uh, inverse depth. Um, and stuff is painted on each of these layers. Uh, you know, these are semi-transparent, each pixel has RGBA value. And then if you want to render a new viewpoint, all you do is apply an appropriate homography to each of the layers and then composite them from back to front order. Uh, so that gives you, if you do the over operation, you get a rendered image. So it's a very powerful uh, um, representation for view synthesis. And here's another visualization. Here's uh, this from our uh, SIGGRAPH 18 paper, where uh, here I'm showing on the right side a bunch of layers. And then magically, if you compose them in the right way and then move the viewpoint uh, to the reference view, you'll see these layers coalesce into a nice 3D scene that looks gives you these you know, compelling view synthesis effects. OK. So these multiplane images, I really like them. They model disocclusion because you know you can represent occluded stuff in a background layer. Um, you can even uh, simulate non-lambertian effects via layering like specularities, and it's it's very efficient and differentiable, uh, so good for learning. Okay, and we have we've done a lot of work involving these MPIs, including uh, this year some work in predicting an MPI from a single image, uh, which allows you again to um, simulate nice. Um, uh, simulate scenes, including uh, scenes with um, non lambertian materials. Uh, so I think I'll just skip over that video. Okay. So, all right. So back to our problem of reconstructing landmarks with time varying appearance. 
Uh, so if you try to do this with an MPI, again, an MPI consists of a set of uh, planar layers, each with, you know, you can think of it as sort of voxels with RGBA values. Um, well, it's a nice representation, but, uh, and you can represent view, you know, you can do novel view synthesis with them. But if you try to, uh, if you try to use them for this task, um, you know, they will not be able to represent any kind of time varying appearance. Okay. So um, they're good for representing a static slice of the panoptic function at a single time, but they won't be able to interpolate appearance across time. Okay. So what we do is, you know, maybe what you would think of as the most natural thing to do is we augment each voxel of this deep MPI with a learnable feature vector. Okay. So in addition to RGBA and opacity alpha, uh, transparency alpha, we have a uh, latent feature vector. Okay, maybe eight dimensions. And this is supposed to capture all of the things you need to represent changing appearance over time as a function of sun position, et cetera. Okay. Um, maybe surface normals and things like that would be encoded in that or, or albedos or whatnot. Um, but we don't impose any kind of uh, constraint on it. it. It's able to learn what whatever is useful. Okay. And so that leads to a two stage approach to fitting these deep MPIs to these internet photo collection images, okay? Uh, first, we actually solve for a normal MPI, okay? We just treat all these images as, uh, as, as if they were from the same time and fit a, a standard RGBA MPI to them, okay? And it turns out the alpha layers you learn are actually pretty good, and I'll show that in a second. And so we fix those alphas, and then we use that as the basis for fitting a deep MPI where we simultaneously learn latent features and a neural decoder that is able to reproduce all the appearances uh, observed in the collection, okay? And the alpha at that stage is fixed. We don't try to, to change the alpha, but um, we get the benefit of using the alpha from this first stage. Alpha basically encodes the shape of the scene as I'll show in a second, okay. So I really like some of these visualizations. So I wanted to show a little bit about how this works. So. Um, so this first stage, we just use um, gradient descent uh, to initialize with a plane sweep volume where we average all the images at specific depths. So we take our MPI, reproject all the input images onto that onto each plane, average them, and use that as the initial color for our for our MPI optimization. And I really like this visualization of a plane sweep volume where you average all these images in this very wonky you know, crowdsource collection. You basically get a, um, you know, it's a refocusing stack with a, uh, you can think this is a camera with a very strange aperture that's shaped like all the <laughs> image positions you have in your set. So basically it's, it's a, you get this um, depth of field effect where as you sweep through the plane, the correct geometry comes into focus. Um, and it kind of looks like the, Average appearance as if you know, uh, you know, the sun were in all possible positions at once. Okay, uh, so that, that's cool. And then we use that, we take that those RGB average values as initialization and optimize for the alpha channel and refine the colors. So um, we use gradient descent to um, to re refine this MPI to solve for this MPI by uh, using reconstruction of each input viewpoint as the reconstruction loss, as the as the loss to minimize. And despite all these images being from different appearance, this magically works pretty well to where you can get the, the output of this is an MPI that looks like a nice MPI of the average illumination, okay? And if you render the alphas as a depth map by just alpha compositing according to depth, uh, you know, you get something that resembles a good depth map for the scene. It's, it's a bit noisy, but it works for view synthesis. Okay, so that's fairly surprising given how different all these images are in the, in the input collection, but it, but it works. Okay, once you have this MPI, you, you take the alpha and then augment, um, you take the alpha channel solved from the first stage and augment it with these latent uh, uh, appearance uh, vectors. Okay, so the idea is, um, we're going to learn this deep MPI that if you warp it to a new viewpoint and then feed it through a decoder, you will then translate it into a normal MPI. So the decoder decodes from deep features to RGB values. 
um, you just copy over the alpha. The alpha is just always fixed in this process. The shape uh, is assumed constant. Um, and OK, how does the generator, this decoder slash generator, know what appearance to render? There's a uh, you know, there's an appearance code representing what appearance you want to render, like nighttime or daytime, or sun is on the left side or the right side. And that modulates this encoder uh, via an add in uh, uh, layer uh, to tell the decoder what kind of appearance to generate. And that uh, latent vector z, that appearance vector, is produced by an encoder that learns to take an exemplar image and produce a, a a vector that represents the appearance of that image. And there's a lot of details here to get this to work. Like instead of feeding a exemplar image as is, which could be from any viewpoint, you sort of normalize the viewpoint by reprojecting it through the MPI to a reference view. So you kind of warp all, you warp your exemplar to the reference view before feeding it to the encoder. So the encoder doesn't need to know about different camera viewpoints and so on. Just is, it's very helpful. Uh, and so those are all the pieces that you need to render these deep MPIs to a particular MPI and then use that for view synthesis. OK, once you have this uh, RGBA MPI decoded, you can render a view. And then if you have that viewpoint in your, ground, in your training set, you can minimize a loss. You can compare this rendered view to the, to the ground truth view and use that a lot as a loss for training end to end the system. OK. So that's the, uh, that's the method. We built a data set of a number of different landmarks uh, which exhibit changing appearance over time, you know, uh, some position, weather, et cetera. Uh, here's some results. So here's the Trevi Fountain. Trevi Fountain has kind of become the go-to example for crowdsourced view synthesis. Here's the Trevi Fountain rendered at six different times according to different uh, exemplar images with uh, view synthesis. So we can generate any you know, sort of time, uh, uh, any, the Trevi fountain at any time of day. Here's another example with the Pinazzo, Piazza Navona. Rome has all sorts of good landmarks for view synthesis, although they tend not to be very specular. It's, it's, it's kind of hard to find specular uh, landmarks, outdoor landmarks in the world. Um, I, so you, you can see it works for this uh, case. Uh, and so, you know, prior work, especially a paper called Neural Rerendering the Wild, has sought to do this kind of uh, view synthesis. But one big difference is that this deep MPI is a consistent representation for every, you know, it's, it's a sort of fixed representation that you decode once and then can render uh, new views from. Whereas with methods like NRW, you feed, you know, a network is kind of invoked for every possible viewpoint. And so you get much less temporal coherence or viewpoint coherence over time. You can see a lot more flickering that, well, I don't know if you can see it with this uh, Zoom-based video sharing, uh, but we have much more stable appearance over as a function of viewpoint. Uh, we can also do things like take two different, uh, okay, I'm gonna close the door since I hear a lot of child noise. I think two children are screaming at the same time. Uh, you can take two different exemplar images and interpolate the appearance between them. And so something nice that's learned by this method is not just the individual appearances, but a space that's meaningful to interpolate. So um, you can compare that to this neural rendering in the wild. And uh, we capture things like shadows. Uh, you know, they're not perfectly sharp, but we capture things like shadows much better with our approach compared to, to prior work. So here's an interpolation between these two viewpoints of the Pantheon. OK. Uh, and you know, finally, here's just some examples where we interpolate both in space and appearance at the same time. So as the camera moves, the uh, you know, night is turning to day. You know, in New York City, the lights of the city uh, turn on and so on. It's fairly nice. Um, now, I should say, OK, there's a, in the time, uh, you know, uh, when we submitted this paper, NERF, which probably all of you know, the famous NERF didn't even exist. And in the time between. Uh, submitting our paper and it being published at ECCV, not only did NERF exist, but a new, another paper called NERF W came out, which uses, instead of MPIs, uh, uses NERF as the basis for uh, spatiotemporal view synthesis. And the advantage of NERF is that you can capture a much larger uh, uh, set of viewpoint. You can render a much larger set of viewpoints than you can with an MPI, which has limited 
uh, uh, sort of ability to extrapolate in space. Um, the disadvantage is that it takes much longer to render views. Once you have with an MPI, it's basically real time. You can run it in a browser. With NERF W, you know, it's it's just uh, you know may take uh, tens of seconds to render an image. Uh, but I guess my main takeaway is, you know, I've been working with these crowdsourced photo collections for a long time. You know, uh, we had this photo tourism work 15 years ago, and it's just amazing to me how much progress has been made in these in this you know landmark based view synthesis problem in the last 15 years. So. It's well, even in the last year, but it, it's just amazing and, and just speaks so well of the, uh, you know, the magic we can do in the field today. Okay, so, uh, you know, you can see code, data, et cetera. If you want to play with these photo collections yourself, they're all online. Um, I think I'll just barrel on. I think Matthias said, good to save questions for the end. So um, I wanted to talk about a, a, a Second project that appeared at ECV, 2000, uh, ECV this year. Um, this is with this is a project from Google AI with uh, um, one of my uh, collaborators, Andrew Liu, and a bunch of collaborators from Berkeley as well. And this, you know, the previous project was about landmark scale. I'm going to talk about city scale now. And so the paper is called "Learning to Factorize and Relight a City." Okay, so let's say you want to apply this, but at the scale of a whole city, you want to be able to generate any viewpoint in a city. At any time and you know, for any place, position at any time. So, like, you know, the uh, well, I'm very familiar with New York City, having lived here for a few years. Well, uh, so you know, you okay. What if you want to render an image near the uh, um, Natural History Museum at a specific date, or you know, you want to render an image from uh, the Upper East Side at a, a totally different date? How would you be able to do this? Um, well, there's a pretty good tool called Google Street View Time Machine. So. Uh, you can play with this, it, you know, uh, it's it's live. This has been up for a few years. Uh, if you go to a place in the street view, you can then scroll to different times and see what, in this case, the Flatiron building looked like uh, over the past eight years. So uh, Time Machine is an amazing resource. Like it's kind of like the Wayback Machine for, for uh, uh, the world. Okay, so uh, what this allows us to do is take any point in space in New York City or many other cities and look up a bunch of uh, panoramas of that position over time. OK, so but if you think of this as a sampling of the panoptic function, it's still incredibly sparse. Like, it's this very strangely sampled time lapse video. You know, samples may come in bursts, but there may be years between them. Uh, so this is not, this doesn't really allow you to, to look up any time, um, but instead, you know, very few specific times. And uh, in addition, if you think of these, as providing sort of time lapse cameras throughout the world, uh, they're not great in the sense that they're also imperfectly aligned. Again, the Street View camera does not pass through exactly the same place every time it drives down the street. Um, but the, I, look, I find this video really cool, but it's not a very like aligned video. So you can think of Street View Time Machine as sampling a bunch of wonky time lapse videos throughout the world. Okay, so what can we do with that? Well, OK, if we go back to this 2D plot of samples of our Palompa function, a single drive of you know, a single street view run, a single drive of a car through a city will capture a fairly uh, will capture a specific instance in time or, you know, uh, you know, may take an hour, but, you know, basically the same time of a set of viewpoints. OK, and maybe the car drove by a year later and then another month after that and two years after that. So you have this. A uh, uh, sparse set of samples in space in time, you know, much more organized than the kind of landmark scale samples, but uh, still very sparse. And so again, the idea is we want to take these samples and recreate any possible sample of this. Uh, you can also think of this in this case as like a matrix completion problem. Given a sparse set of entries in this matrix, each entry is an image, recreate the entire matrix. Okay. And so as with you know a, a common method for kind of matrix completion involves, uh, especially with low rank matrices, involves factorization. So we're essentially going to do the same thing here. Um, the idea is that you can take the range of appearance at a specific place, like this particular intersection in New York City, and decompose it into things that stay fixed over time, in this case, like the geometry and appearance of the buildings, more or less fixed, um, and things that change over time, like lighting. 
So again, I'm going to focus mainly on lighting in this talk, not like cars driving through the city. Okay, so you you, know, you have a you can decompose it into permanent things, which I'm showing on the x-axis, and time varying things like sky color and sun position and weather. Okay, so keep yeah you know, we're going to have in mind this solving this problem as a factorization problem but with a factorization approach. And if you can do that, if you can solve for you know, if you can separate an image into these factors, then you can modify an image to any desired appearance. So if we can decompose this into permanent and spatial temporal and, and temporally varying factors, we can then um, you know, change, modify the temporal factors and render, say, an entire day's worth of a time-lapse video of this of this place. Okay, of this intersection. Uh, so that's that's essentially completing the matrix of views as factorization and then uh, combining factors to recreate missing values. Okay, we can change the sun position, we can introduce different sky conditions uh, once we do factorization. All right, but how do we do this factorization? So this is like a very long running problem in computer vision in some sense, this kind of factorization. It, it, you might think of it as in a form of intrinsic images. And intrinsic images is intrinsically hard because it, from a single image, it's very hard to tell, and it's very opposed what things are permanent and what things are will change if you look at the scene later. So you can take this patch of image and you know that this is a shadow that will change in five minutes or you know this changes over time. But for a machine, it's very hard. You know, there's very little cues available in a single image telling us what pixels are permanent, which are time varying. For all the machine knows, this is a building painted with a black shadow shaped uh, you know, artwork. Um, because you know, all these things are entangled together. All these different factors are entangled together in a single image. So uh, if all we have is single images, this kind of intrinsic image problem is very difficult. Um, but what we have is not single images, but we have wonky time-lapse cameras. That's what Google Street View gives us. Uh, Google Street View Time Machine gives us. So, and we don't have just one of them. We have you know millions of these wonky time-lapse videos from around the world. Okay, uh, I'm also going to call these wonky time-lapse videos. They're wonky because they're sampled strangely, uh, you know, over time, and because they're not aligned. But I'll you know, I'll refer to these each. Uh, Time lapse from a, a nearby location as a stack. Okay, so we at Google have access to all this data. So we mine Street View around New York City for stacks. We just uh, built a scrape uh, engine for identifying these stacks, these kind of accidental time lapses, um, and we came up with a data set of hundreds of thousands of these stacks uh, over New York City. And so we have a test, a training set, and then test set for seeing how well uh, this factorization works for unseen data. OK, so how do we solve this problem? How do we solve this as a factorization problem? So imagine a single stack of images over time. OK, what we're going to do is we're going to have a, a per image encoder, so an encoder that can take each individual image and produce two sets of factors, a time varying factor in yellow and a permanent factor in red. OK? And we're going to, these are learnable factors. I'll talk, I'll talk about how we do learn them in a second. But uh, these, to show you, you know, we, to show a little bit more detail about what, the fact, what these factors are, we found it very useful to impose some structure on them. Okay, so the time varying factors in yellow consist of a latent uh, vector per image. And the, this is completely latent, it, it just learns whatever is useful and a thing that can represent an angle. So what I'm showing on the, the, these kind of things on the bottom, these black and white uh, uh, vectors, these represent something that can change as a function of, of angle, basically azimuth. The idea is that this should learn to capture sun angle, but we don't impose that on the model. We just learn something that is a, it's like a, um, a representation that represents an angle. So what this is basically a histogram over possible azimuth angles. And you can take the expected value of it to represent a specific angle. Okay, so the model knows how to how to represent things that basically things that can differ as as in in terms of heading, and it can learn a kind of arbitrary appearance, something that represents arbitrary appearance. Okay, the idea is the bottom one represents some, will hopefully learn to represent some position, 
Uh, the top one will learn other factors like weather and you know haze and so on. Okay, that's the temporally varying factor. The permanent factor is a latent code arranged as a spatial map, an image, a low resolution spatial map. Uh, so the idea is that this should learn things like surface normals, should learn things that are per relatively permanent, but important for rendering like surface normals, materials, whether a pixel is the sky or the building or the ground, et cetera, okay? So what do we do with these factors? Okay, then there's a decoder that decodes them into standard intrinsic images layer, a reflectance on the bottom here. This is kind of the albedo of the scene and the per image shading. Okay. Uh, this resembles intrinsic images, but remember these are decoded from factors that can be, that are generic and can be swapped between scenes. And I'll talk more about that later. Okay. And so then using these decoded shading and reflectance images, you can recombine them to reproduce the original images. Okay. So that's sort of the pipeline. Take a stack of images, decode each one into time varying and permanent factors, decode those into a per image shading and a per stack reflectance, uh, and then recombine them, into, you know, reconstruct the original stack with the with those factors. And now you have a way to train. Basically, you learn these factors and the decoder and encoder uh, so as to with the loss of the reconstruction, you know, the reconstructed images should equal the input images. And what you get from these being from the same position is that the reflectance should be shared across all the images. So you want, you, you have an additional loss that says the reflectance should be constant. You can almost think of this as a compression problem. You're compressing out all the stuff that's constant over time, like albedo, and, uh, and then representing separately the stuff that's, um, that changes over time, the shading. And you know, they're compressed into these learned factors. Okay, once you learn these factors, what can you do? Well, you can apply it, you know, first of all, you can apply this to new images at test time. You know, here's an image from Paris. We learned from New York City, but you can apply it to Paris. Um, and, and I'll talk about, you can do relighting. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but one other important factor in this learning is that, as I mentioned, these images are not aligned. Uh, so if I just took an average of a stack, uh, and here's a crop of an average, you know, you see ghost, horrible ghosting because these images aren't aligned. If you try to align them as RGB images, that alignment doesn't work, just like using congealing or something. And it doesn't work because the appearance changes over time, the shadows are in different places, that makes you know, RGB-based alignment not work. So what we do is we align the images, but using the decoded reflectances, because the reflectances are exactly meant to be, you know, to be constant across the stack. And so it works much better to align those reflectances, which means we, we have to both, we have to iteratively align the images and solve for reflectance uh, you know, over time. So here's a time-lapse uh, you know, of our method showing reflectance and alignment learn jointly. Okay, so I'm talking to my friend still, okay. <laughs> okay, um, so, okay, so putting all together, um, here's something you can do with this. You can take two input images at different places and times, and you can decode their time varying factors and permanent factors. You know, this is just a visualization of the permanent factors. It's not really an RGB image. Um, and then what you can do is something like uh, decode the reflectance images and swap the time varying factors and decode the uh, corresponding shading images. So I've kept the seen the same, but swapped the two uh, time varying factors. This is something you can't do with kind of classic methods like intrinsic images, where you can't just take the shading image from one scene and apply it to another scene. They don't, you know, they're too low level pixel based representations, but we, we can do it with these time varying factors. And so then I can uh, recombine those views using just the you know, intrinsic image of reflectance time shading and get an image of the same scene, but um, but rendered with the other images appearance. So like this turns into a cloudy scene, this turns into a sunny scene lit from a specific sun angle. Uh, again, here's an example where we um, apply this model in New York City to Paris. We can relight uh, this Paris scene with any possible, uh, we just swap in new appearance codes to render the uh, uh, different appearance. Okay, 
Now, how do we evaluate this? Well, one thing you can't, I mean, it's hard to evaluate these, this kind of factorization approach, but one thing you can do is evaluate it in terms of intrinsic images. Uh, how good are the intrinsic image factors you learn? Uh, here's our model. Here's a couple of other recent approaches that are uh, learned intrinsic image decomposition methods. I'm showing reflectance in the first row, shading in the second row. Um, and the thing you want to see in intrinsic image decompositions into reflectance and shading is that the shading images ha should have no diffuse texture in them. And so our method does a very good job of that uh, compared to other methods where you can see kind of stuff baked into the shading image that shouldn't be there. Uh, it's almost as if our shading images is, is what you would see if the entire city were covered in snow. That's a kind of a beautiful kind of image, but uh, that it's showing it's doing a, a good job of intrinsic images and numerically it does a good job too. So, um, you know, you can see all the, uh, we're starting to put code in, trying to release a data set. Releasing street view data takes time, but we're working on it so other people can play with this. Uh, here's just a bunch of time lapses over the course of the day rendered from our method. Okay, so with that, uh, I'd like to just conclude. We're taking, you know, we're, we're not yet able to capture this full panoptic function, but we're taking baby steps towards it. Okay, here's Peppa Pig. Um, how, you know, for both of these projects, data was, I would say, the most important factor. Like having good sample, you know, ability to get samples of, of data over time as densely as possible is very important. Um, street view, for instance, we couldn't have done it without street view. Uh, but a lot of challenges remain. So scaling this up to the entire world, you know, world scale panoptic rendering. Our, right now, our models are not physically realistic. We have these latent codes. We, we represent some things that are, have a physical interpretation like sun angles, but we're not really doing any kind of true rendering. What that means is that things like sharp shadows are hard to render with our neural models. And things which would be much easier to render if we truly like represented light transport to the scene and occlusion. Um, so I think like bringing more physical realism and more inverse graphics, you know, including stuff like what's been done in, in Munich, uh, I think would be a great direction. Uh, an even harder problem is bringing scenes truly to life. Like a lot of the things that you want to see in a scene, if you're sitting in that cafe across from the Pantheon, is the tourists milling around or the you know, clouds drifting through the sky or the trees waving in the wind or, you know, fountains burbling with water and you want to get audio. Uh, so I think capturing those dynamic elements are very important. Like not maybe literally showing the exact people who are there, but, you know, capturing the essence of the place. Uh, you know, we're also not, you know, those are sort of very short time scale things. We're also not capturing long term scale changes. So uh, things like trees growing or the seasons um, are not really modeled right now. Um, and that would also be a compelling direction. So with that, thank you for your attention and thank you to all my collaborators on this work. And uh, you can see more information at the uh, these respective web pages. Thank you. Hey, yeah, cool, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, really amazing research. Um, I guess we have a bit of time for questions, right? Um, if, if anybody on Zoom has a question, can you just let me know? This is so cool. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's always a bit tricky to get the students to engage via the virtual settings. I mean, we're, oh, we're trying the best. <laughs> I was just saying, I, 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 I'm, when I moved, I forgot to bring my clock. So I didn't actually know how much time we have. But yeah, we, have, we have enough time. I mean, unless yeah. you have to move. No, uh, no, I'm good. So um, I have actually one question. So I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I really appreciate, you know, that like highlighting the, the necessity for data. I mean, it, it's just, like we are spending so much effort in the community. What do you think? Like, how can we let, how can we make it easier, right? Like, what what's the goal? I mean, I personally would say, well, there's directions you can do brute force annotations. You can build light stages and stuff like this, or you can go on the other hand. You can, um, I don't know, you can do synthetic data. But scaling this up to real world scenes is so tricky. So, so what do you think is the most practical way to approach the problem there? Uh, yeah, I think I, I don't know how to do it, but I think, so I don't even think we have good data sets for even a, even a constant time view synthesis. Like even if, even if you factor out lighting, I'm not sure we have good data sets for training and evaluating just, um, just the view synthesis problem. We have good data sets for things like um, light field, you know, training something over, 
represent like a light field where you can move your head a little bit. But things like a object in a real world scene, like, um, I don't know, like, a, a, you know, a Tanks and Temples has some of these examples if you're familiar with that data set. So t uh, like um, objects embedded in real world scenes. Um, Nerf shows some examples, but we don't really have a, I'm not aware of like large scale data sets uh, that of, you know, of sort of um, 360 scenes that you want to, you know, capture and run, view from any viewpoint around the object. Um, even for that view synthesis task, I don't think we have good data. So I think that's the easy problem to solve right now is just someone think about what the right data sets for real world view synthesis are that are allow for kind of arbitrary motion. Uh, I think, you know, this free view synthesis paper from Vladlin has some data, but it's, I think it's not enough. Um, if someone knows of a data set that's just like <laughs> thousands of scenes um, captured from freely moving video all around an object, I, uh, please let me know. But I, I mean, the hard problem is it's a six degree of freedom issue, right? You just, you just can't, all, can't sample densely so easily, right? And then yeah, have, yeah, but right. I, I totally agree. But what, I, what I'd be happy with is just a set of videos with each of which has two videos, like an outer ring and an inner ring. And you learn the appearance from the outer ring and the goal is to synthesize from the inner ring. Okay, that would be the kind of first thing I would, that, that, that's, I feel like that is a fairly little bar and that is, that is what I want. But I think maybe Matthias that you're raising an interesting question which is I think probably each different method might want slightly different kinds of data. So maybe, and, and so the thing that would probably work for everybody is densely sampled you know, light fields around objects so that you could do any kind of training and test split you want. But I agree, that's hard. So maybe the thing I want will not be useful to others, but um, that is my specific. <laughs> no, I, I see what you're saying, but I think, yeah. you know, I mean, there's a bunch of data sets for like using 3D reconstruction, structure for motion in whatever way, but but they all, like, as you say, I think they're always specific to one, to one method, right? They're not like generalizable. I yeah, and often they're fairly small. I mean, the synthetic data is big, but um, unless you have like, um, I don't know. So there's good Lytro data sets because you can capture with Lytro easily, there, you know, but um, it's- I mean, it's, even, but even, yeah. even the, I don't know. I mean, it's not just the size alone, right? It's just the, the number of images you have is typically very low compared to the space you're sampling. That's I mean, I don't know. My dream would be, oh, you have like, you have even one object, like densely sampling all the poses around this object and do like a, a cross evaluation is hard. So all you can do is in this post space or in, in the few space, of course, right? You, you would only have a very sparse checks and you can check if these ones you got right. So some, re, some poses you have in the train, some in the volume, you re-render and you yeah. see what happens. So for some object, this works, but for, as you say, right, for, for larger scenes, this is pretty, Pretty, pretty challenging because there's not so much around. But I mean, recording right now, you can do pretty easily. And reconstruction, you can probably do to some degree. Like, I mean, getting the camera pose is not well, doable, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a whole other ball of wax. I'm, I'm mainly trying to do view synthesis evaluation, which all you need is held out views. Yeah. Now, like in things like tanks and temples, they also did like laser scans. If you really want to do like, you know, scene reconstruction, that's like much harder, but. Um, but, but I mean, like you can take any 3D scene data set for that, right? Like yes, some, some 3D, there's even like Scanner, Matterport, all of these ones, they all have, I mean, you can argue, you know, what quality you want in terms of the views. Do you want to have high quality DSLR? I mean, Tang and Temples is an interesting data set, but I think, yeah, I mean, it, it's just, it's, it's a high quality data set that was like, in a, in a, it, it doesn't apply yeah. to any commodity setting, right? I mean, I'm yeah, glad to see good. this on a webcam. <laughs> I mean, Matterport is a good, yeah, I think Matterport 3D is good for some things, um, but it's it's fairly indoor focused. Um, I think, um, yeah, we're actually using Matterport 3D for a few, for some non-view synthesis projects. Uh, what else, like there's also, um, I don't know, there's a lot of data sets, but they're sort of, and I think there's also data sets that people don't know about that should be more popular. I don't know, but it's it's fairly like. Uh, so, so for me, like that. right now, what I what I I mean, we're having similar issues, right? Like when we are testing things like Metaport or so are fine, but for training, it's not because you're not sampling the function densely enough. 
That's right. Yeah. Like so, the number of views is just way too small. I mean, Metaport is a good example. You have only one, one pod locations like every two or three meters. So, like capturing something like view dependent effects is 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 really difficult in the training samples. Yeah, that, that is very difficult, right? So you won't get this out of this kind of data. Like getting the right specular highlight at the right angle is it's just you just don't get it, right? Um, and on the other hand, you have synthetic data sets, but there the material definitions are all pretty bad. Either it's like just a single object with a texture, or you have larger data sets where you know the texture material lighting information is pretty bad. Yeah, I I agree. Um, uh, yeah, like I, I think Nerf had some interesting data sets with specularities, but again, like your synthetic data with maybe better materials, but it's still fairly small. So, um, I mean, do it for single object cases, right? Like like even Nerf. Like what's pretty interesting, I think about it. I mean, I think Nerf is a really fantastic paper. But if you're considering the previous papers there, like this neural point-based rendering, right? They're evaluating on, on scenes or like the, the work by Peter Hedman where, where they're going ahead and like this uh, inside out rendering, right? They're right. blending the views together. These guys, they're, they're having a much, a much more challenging task. And if, you, if you're running NERF on these kind of data sets, they don't look as good right now as like, like Peter's work I think is really great actually. Like these results, I think are rock solid. Getting to that quality is not so easy. Yeah, I, um, I I think yeah I, I feel like somebody yeah so, so I think someone could have a very high impact by focusing on data and figuring out the right way to solve this problem. Um, maybe it will be like hiring a lot of artists to do it, maybe or something. I don't know, but. Um, yeah, I, I think now that's not even talking about sort of the multi lighting kind of thing, but yeah, I mean, I really like the stuff you've been doing in the, in the open surface data sets because it's a very simple thing, right? It's like just have a click, is it the same or not? Yeah, that could but be. I, that I, I really, I really feel, you know, it doesn't give you all the ground truth, but it's good enough to do evaluation and you can probably even do some training for clustering methods and so on. Yeah, I always wanted to use that data set more for things even like. Um, we had people annotate like rough, roughly what the specular component looks like, like the, the shape of the specular lobe. And I always thought like, I don't know, even just somebody being able to take like scenes and say where specularities are. Like, I, I don't know of a good method for just like, okay, classifying every point as a specular highlight or not. I mean, that seems like would also be very useful, but um, yeah, anyway. There might be like some high impact data sets that are with human annotation. I agree. Yeah, um, th there's other questions. I don't want to dominate the discussion. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I didn't know. Uh, yeah, if someone else wants to time. Yeah, uh, I think Juan, you, you wanted to ask something? Um, yes. Um, uh, uh, thanks for the talk. It was uh, quite nice. Actually, I was wondering with the last method that you present, uh, you talk about this image uh, decomposition. Uh, how do you supervise the, this, uh, this entanglement? You know, when you mention uh, the reflection and so on. Yeah, so there's the only supervision is, well, you can think of it as GPS. The only supervision is having other images taken from almost the same place, but different times. And so the supervision is not direct. It comes from that the reflectance or sort of the, the, the permanent factors decoded from each image in that stack have to be the same. Okay, that's one sort of more implicit weak, weak supervision. And then it also, you know, you have to be able to reconstruct the images from the two factors. That's another kind of supervision, just a reconstruction uh, loss. And then the rest of it is just, and this is what took the most time, is figuring out how to structure the factors uh, and the you know the overall network such that the the right thing was learned or or the 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 right factorization was achieved. So um, we tried a lot. We tried a million different things, but and what we what we found is that this angular representation is very important. Like the sun is so predominant. We're we're not actually supervising the sun position. We do have them by the way from Street View because we know what time they were taken. But we don't use that for supervision. We should do it later, probably. It will be very helpful. But 
just having something that can represent an angle is very important. Um, and that, that was one of the things that made it work. But so I guess there's some priors imposed by the model, but otherwise there's no direct supervision. Okay, thanks. Any, any other questions? There's actually a couple of questions on YouTube. I'm trying to ask a question from there. Oh, so, I don't see any questions on YouTube, but yeah. Oh, you don't? Okay, that's, uh, oh, I, I'm just gonna read it. I, I'll, just, I'll just do it this way. Sorry, I don't have YouTube. I should say I don't have YouTube open, so I don't. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. I'll, I'll just ask. Um, so okay. one question is when dealing with multiple images from different cameras, how does the model channelize the multiple images with different camera parameters, like the intrinsic parameters, right? When they're not matching. Uh, well, so for that, that's mainly relevant in the crowd sampling work. Yeah. Um, we calibrate the intrinsics, and then um, you know, basically, whenever you reproject an image into the MPI volume, you have to take its intrinsics into account. So that's uh, just handled when, whenever you turn a a uh, pixel into array, you apply the intrinsic. So we we have all that calibrated by structural motion. Cool. Thanks. Um, any other questions? I guess one question is, would LIDAR captures be useful to obtain video data? Well, yeah, of course, I guess if you, <laughs> if, if you, if you had enough views, it would be probably useful. Did someone um, say, sorry, was that LIDAR? Yeah, one, no, what they're asking, I think, would LIDAR captures be useful to obtain video data? Like using a point glyph LIDAR to generate the video from different viewpoints. So I think they're asking, yeah. kind of, can you get a reconstruction and then re-rendering it and so on? Yeah, I mean, Street View does have LIDAR sensors. We're not using them. Um, they're, they're, you know, there's all sorts of like hard, tricky calibration issues between the cameras and the LIDAR, but that would be useful for certain things, certainly. Okay, um, one question is, is it important for the crowd sampling that the appearance changes are periodic or would it work for uh, historic images like 100 years time span? Yes, we're only really modeling things that are, well, we have not demonstrated any kind of, um, well, oh, let me put it this way. Anything that should be represented as a change to the permanent factors over time is not represented. So, you know, a lot of things that happen over a hundred year time span are the buildings are painted, the buildings have, um, you know, the, the buildings are just demolished and built again. Right now, we're not trying to handle anything like that. So the primary thing that you see is periodic changes and changes to weather. I see. I, I would like to like to see the extrapolation to the future. This would be really yeah, cool, like, right? That would be so cool. <laughs> I mean, I right now, yeah, to put it another way, we're handing sort of like time scales that are intermediate, things that have to do with illumination, like the yeah. sun. We're not handling very short things like people moving, yeah. and we're not handling very long term things. But I agree, like being able to like extrapolate, you know, what would the city look like in 10 years? I would, you know, I would love that. I think the problem is right now, like Google hasn't been around for long enough to have the data for training. If you had like a, a, like a few thousand years of like Google Maps training data for that, you could probably extrapolate better. Yeah, I, I mean, I've used some historical photos in my work before. Like I, I would love to like just have something that scraped up all possible data. I mean, <laughs> if, if you go on Flickr, you can find photos from 1970s. So if you augmented Street View with like, uh, or, or you know, the Library of Congress photo archives, whatever, you do have data, uh, but yeah, it's just uh, you know, sparse and harder to deal with. Yeah, well, and the quality is just lower, right? Like typically, yeah. but it's not the same quality. I think then it's really, really hard to to to, to learn like a temporal model how it would you know develop in the future. I mean, I remember you gave a talk at some point about like I don't know which paper this was, but, like we had these um, videos from Times Square where they were changing over time and what's happening. I think this was pretty cool, right? But if you could extrapolate this in the future for the next I don't know fifty years, that would be awesome. That would be so cool. <laughs> um, Any other questions? I may have to run. If there, maybe I could take one more question, then I may have to run. But okay, uh, if there are any questions. But. Okay, no, we, it's okay. You, you, we, we can we can relieve you. <laughs> Thanks okay, a lot. Okay, no, uh, this is super fun, and thank you for bearing with me with kids I, coming into the picture. I think this is great, by the way. I think your, your daughter <laughs> is the secret star here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you so much, everybody. Thanks a lot. All right, That's take okay. care. Bye bye. Okay, bye. See you.